offspring of those who saw the world more accurately. And so we can be pretty confident that when I see tables and chairs and the sun and the moon and so forth, that I'm seeing reality as it is. No one believes we see all of reality, of course. We only see the parts that we need to see. Uh, but that the parts that we do see, we're seeing truthfully. And so I've looked at that from the point of view of the mathematics of evolution, the evolutionary game theory. And we can actually run simulations to see what happens and we can prove theorems. And we've, we've done both. And the bottom line is that the probability, if our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection, the probability that we see reality as it is, is zero. And that, that means not simply that I, you know, I don't quite see the shape of a chair correctly or I don't quite see the colors correctly. It's, it's much deeper than that. The problem is that the very language of space and time and physical objects is the wrong language to describe objective reality. You, you could not frame a true description of the world in that language, it's not possible. So it's not that we get it off a little bit here or there, it's that the, this whole thing is just the wrong framework for describing reality. So that seems so counterintuitive and so out there that I think a metaphor is needed to help understand how it might be working. And the metaphor I like is um, the user interface on, you know, the desktop interface on your computer. If you're um, writing an email and the icon for that email is blue and rectangular and in the middle of your screen, does that mean that the email itself, the file in your computer is blue, rectangular and in the middle of the computer? Well, of course not. Anybody who thought that misunderstands the point of the desktop interface. It's not there to show you the truth in this metaphor, the truth be the circuits and the voltages and magnetic fields. All that complexity, most of us don't want to know about that. That's really nasty. If you had to toggle voltages to craft an email, your friends wouldn't hear from you. It's just too hard. So what evolution has done for us is it's evolved us sensory systems. Touch, smell, sight, sound hearing, all of this, all these sensory interfaces as a user interface that the purpose is to hide reality, completely to hide reality, just like your desktop interface on your computer is there to hide the circuits. You don't want to know about the circuits and yet it allows you to control the circuits, right? By using icons and dragging them and clicking and so forth. You can control the reality without knowing anything at all about it. And that's what evolution did. Three-dimensional space is your desktop. It's a three-dimensional desktop, not just a two-dimensional desktop. And the icons are three-dimensional, not just flat. They're what we call physical objects. So tables and chairs and spoons and forks, these are icons that evolution has shaped to tell us about fitness payoffs and how to get them. So evolution, in short, has shaped us with a user interface that hides reality on purpose. Or, you know, purpose is in quotes. Evolution is just a process. But, but it, the effect of the, of the process is really to hide reality so that, um, so that you're, you're, you're not um, distracted by it and you, you, you can control reality without actually knowing what it is. So now the question that you asked is, what is that reality? And I mean, the, the right answer is, I don't know. Right? If the very predicates, the, the language of our perceptions, according to our one of our best theories, you know, evolution by natural selection, if the very language of our perceptions is the wrong language to describe reality, then it's a tough problem. I. What I'm doing as a scientist is I'm suggesting that, well, I'm trying to understand a specific scientific problem, which is, for me, it's, it's called the hard problem of consciousness. 
and I'm trying to think of a theory of reality that will allow me to solve this hard problem of consciousness. The problem is this. We have a lot of interesting data that gives us correlations between certain kinds of brain activity and certain conscious experiences that we have. So for example, we know that if, if I take a powerful magnet called a, trans mag, a transcranious magnetic stimulator and touch it to a part of the skull that's just next to an area called V4, and if I inhibit my neural activity in that area, immediately all color will drain from the left part of my visual world. I'll just see shades of gray. I'll still see color in the right part of the visual world, but not in the left. Then you turn off the magnet and color comes flowing back in. So there's this very interesting correlation between interference with neural activity in the, in the, the right hemisphere and loss of certain kind of conscious experience in the left visual world. Correlations are the raw data. This brain activity is correlated with that conscious experience. And of course, correlations are not a theory. Rooster crows are correlated with sunrises. But that's not a theory. For example, does a rooster crow cause a sunrise? Well, no. That's, we would tend to think it might go the other way. But, but it's hard to go from correlations to a genuine theory of what's causing it. We can predict your choices that you'll make in certain cases, your free will choices, um, seven seconds before you can tell me what you're going to choose. So here again, brain activity is cleanly correlated with your experience seven seconds later of a choice that you're making. So here again, we have this correlation. In this case, you might say, well, okay, here, clearly the theory is the brain activity came first, the experience of feeling like you had a free will choice came a few seconds later, so clearly the brain activity had to cause it, and that's too quick. If I'm in a virtual reality game like Grand Theft Auto, and I've got a steering wheel, I can say, look, I can intervene. I can turn the steering wheel to the left. That will make the car turn to the left. Therefore, the, the steering wheel is real, and it really does have an effect on a real car. No, it's not. There's, again, a hidden reality of diodes and resistors, all the circuits, that's mediating this. It only, we only have the fiction of intervening and a fiction of causality. So the problem we have in the hard problem of consciousness is this. Scientists have gotten dozens, maybe hundreds, of these tight correlations. We do not have a theory. We cannot explain why neural activity is correlated with conscious experiences. In particular, we can't offer a single conscious experience. Like, say, by conscious experience, I mean something really simple, like having a headache, experiencing color, the taste of vanilla. The theories that are proposed are basically only believed by the graduate students of the professor who proposes them. And, and no theory that's been proposed can even predict or, or specify the conditions for a single experience, like the taste of vanilla.
that's the problem we've got. It's, it's a really deep, open, scientific problem. And it's very personal. We all have conscious experiences. We would like to understand what's... And we also, we also have brains. We'd like to understand what's happening here. What's, why, are, why are these correlations there? And so, this theory of evolution that I mentioned that says we don't see reality as it is, has a really strange consequence. It means that when I see a physical object like an apple, effectively I'm creating that apple as a data structure in my interface. Much like if I'm in a virtual reality and I I'm, have a headset on, and every time I turn over here, I will see something. I'm rendering that in real time. I see an apple. As I go over here, um, I'm no longer rendering. I, you know, I, the, the apple's gone. But as soon as I turn over there again, I will again create a three-dimensional apple. So I'm saying this it doesn't just happen in virtual reality. It happens in everyday life. I look over here. I see an apple. I'm literally creating that data structure. But that means that the objects don't exist as pre-existing things. When I see an apple, we like to think, well, I'm, that's because there really is an apple. And I'm saying, no, no, there's some other reality out there. But just like the blue icon on your desktop doesn't re resemble the true file, the apple does not resemble anything in objective reality. It's an abstract data structure that's just telling you how to act to get fitness payoffs. Here's the kicker, when you look inside your brain, inside your skull, and you see a brain, that's also just a data structure that you're creating. Neurons are just data structures. They don't exist, and this is the weird stuff. I don't have a brain when no one looks. The point of this is that, that we create any physical object that we see in the moment that we see it. And so neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. Therefore, neurons could not be the source of our conscious experiences. In fact, space-time itself is just your data structure. So the idea that space-time exists and has existed for 14 billion years as a pre-existing stage in which the drama of life plays out is also deeply wrong. Space-time itself is just a data structure that we create. So what is reality? It's a long answer to your question, but the answer is I don't know, but I'm trying to come up with a reality that would allow me to solve this hard problem of consciousness. If I start with a theory in which consciousness is fundamental, and I have to do it scientifically, say, what do I mean precisely by consciousness uh, with mathematical precision? And, and I have this theory that I call conscious agents, in which conscious agents interact. It's like a, the, the proposal is that reality is a vast social network. It's a, like a Twitterverse or Facebook. So it's, it's a big social network of conscious agents. That's the reality. They're not in space and time. They're they're just consciousnesses interacting with each other. As they interact, they uh, are passing experiences back and forth. And there's, it's, it's an infinite Twitterverse, an infinite set of consciousnesses out there in this, in this um, big social universe, social, you know, yeah, social network universe. And any single conscious agent in that network would be overwhelmed trying to understand all of it. Like if you were trying to understand Twitter, there's tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users, billions of tweets. How are you going to try to understand what's going on in the Twitterverse? Well, you can't, but what you can do is you can use visualization tools. Suppose I have a visualization tool that compresses it all down, shows you what's trending in this city and what's trending over there. So you compress it all down, maybe into something that you can see through a headset, so that you can actually, uh, well, here's the Twitterverse in, in London, here's the Twitterverse in Edinburgh, and so forth, and here's what's, what's going on, here's what's trending. Then you could sort of visualize it. That's what evolution did for us. The reality is this big, vast social network of interacting conscious agents. Each individual agent would be overwhelmed because it's infinite social network. And so what we call the physical world just is our visualization tool. That's what we have. I'll give you one concrete example to really bring it home. When you look at your face in the mirror, all you see literally is skin, hair, and eyes. But what you know firsthand that you don't see in the mirror is the whole universe of your conscious experiences, your hopes, your desires, your aspirations, your headache, 
um, the, the sound of music that you're hearing right now, um, your love of, of music, all the stuff that's you, that's a, it's an almost infinitely complicated universe of conscious experiences. All we can see is this. My face, the, the, the face that you're creating when you look at me, is your portal into my conscious experiences. The face that I see when I look at you is my portal into your conscious experiences. It's a portal, but it's very, very small portal. Most of you is left out. You can't see it in the mirror, I can't see it from outside. When I look at my cat, the portal is even worse. I mean, I can figure out maybe the cat likes this kind of food and doesn't like that, likes it when I pet, but now I've petted it too much, now I need to uh, stop. When I look at an ant, my interface is really giving up. I have no insight into the conscious agents in this vast network that I'm interacting with. And when I get to what I call a rock, my interface has given up, but it has to give up. I have a finite interface, I'm dealing with an infinite social network. Of course the interface, that's its purpose, is to throw most of the information away, to simplify things and allow me to negotiate with this universe of you know, interacting conscious agents. So of course at some point it's not going to look conscious anymore at all. My interface is giving up. But what we've done is we've mistaken a necessary limitation of our interface as a, and we've taken it to be an insight into the fundament, fundamental nature of reality. We've assumed that reality fundamentally is unconscious because at the simplest level our interface is necessarily unconscious. So physicalism is a very simple mistake. This assumption that space-time and matter are fundamental is a simple mistake. We've mistaken a limit of our interface as an insight into objective reality. But it's a, you know, we, can, we can break out of it. It's, it's, it's a natural mistake, but we can break out of it. An electron really exists, and it really does have physical properties whether or not it's observed, like position, momentum, and spin, but in addition it has a unit of consciousness. And when an electron and a proton get together, then somehow the unit of consciousness from the electron and the unit of consciousness from the proton have to interact to create the consciousness of hydrogen. In some sense is what you would just say, well, what I was already saying, that the fundamental nature of reality just is consciousness. What I can show mathematically is I can, from the network of the simple conscious agents, I can build networks that simulate selves, that simulate intelligence, that have memories, and so forth. So I want to be very, very clear that I'm saying that consciousness is fundamental, and I'm proposing, I mean, I don't know what the truth is, I'm just a scientist, I'm just proposing a bold hypothesis that consciousness, and consciousness is fundamental and it's real. Now if that's false, it's false, we'll find out. But the idea of science is to be precise and bold so that we can precisely find out where we're wrong. Of course I'm probably wrong. I don't think any scientific theory I've read so far is correct, including general relativity and quantum field theory and so forth. They're brilliant. They're wonderful tools, we should study them. They're the best we've got so far, and they're almost surely deeply wrong. And so the same is true of my theory. I won't say it's brilliant, but I'll say it's probably deeply wrong, at least it's precise. In science, we cannot explain everything. We always, in our theories, we have to say, please grant me these two or three assumptions. We want them as few as possible. But those assumptions are just given. The theory does not explain them. They're like miracles with respect to the theory. And, and the scientist then says, if you will grant me these assumptions, then I can build this really powerful theory. So for example, grant me space-time and quantum fields. If you'll grant me that, then I can then show you how you know, chemistry and biology and psychology and you know, so forth might arise from that. And so the, the point in any scientific theory is you have to say, I'm proposing these things are fundamental in the universe. How did they get there? I don't know. I really don't know. Just please grant me that. So 
So it's in that sense I'm saying, um, for sake of argument, please grant me that conscious experiences like the taste of vanilla, having a headache, that these are the fundamental furniture of the universe, not space-time and atoms and quarks and so forth. The, the, these raw experiences, as, as experiences, are the fundamental aspect of reality. So for my theory, those are the miracles. Those are the miracles. And then if you grant me that, then I will show how we can create space-time and physical objects as a user interface to this whole vast social network of these conscious experiencers. And it was looking at the mathematics that I suddenly realized that it was suggesting to me that we might not necessarily have to see reality as it is. And that was so stunning I had to sit down. But it took me um, another 20 years before I decided to actually pursue that using um, evolutionary game theory. I was surprised how the math came out when it actually said for very deep principled reasons that natural selection would drive any true perceptions to complete extinction. So, so it's been, um, it's not just been an intellectual odyssey, it's been an emotional odyssey. This is upsetting. It's actually upsetting to realize that something I deeply believed all my life is just fundamentally wrong. I think, and there may be good reason evolutionarily. I mean, evolution, there's no selection pressures for us to know that we don't see the truth. Right? If, you're, if you have a user interface and it's working to keep you alive long enough to reproduce, it's doing what it needs to do. There's no selection pressures to also tell you, oh, by the way, this is just a game. You're not, you're not seeing the truth. This is just a user interface. And, and so we deeply believe it. We, in fact, we believe that because we have to take our perceptions seriously, right? That, for, we, that we should therefore also take them literally. I mean, one objection people give to me is to say, you know, Don, if, you're, if you think that that train coming down the tracks at 200 miles an hour is just an icon in your interface, why don't you just hop in front of it and after you're dead and this silly theory with you, we'll know that that train was real, it's not just an icon, and it really can't kill. And, and I wouldn't jump in front of the train for the same reason I wouldn't drag my blue icon to the trash can icon, carelessly. Not because I take the icon literally, the, the file is not blue and rectangular. But I do take the icon seriously. If I drag it to the trash can, I could lose my work. Maybe I've written a book and it's taken me a couple years. I could lose all that work, so I better take the icon seriously, but that does not entitle me to take it literally. And so that's part of human nature. We were inclined to this illogical assumption that because we have to take all of our perceptions seriously, we're entitled to take, to take them literally. The reason we have to take them seriously is evolution shaped them to keep us alive. Evolutionary psychology also, well, some work by in cognitive neuroscience and evolutionary psychology also makes me be very, very careful. We, we, we know that in, there's certain split brain patients, they, they've had um, epilepsy, um, and that wasn't curable by the available drugs and so they did a surgery where they cut the brain in half so that the right hemisphere was separated from the left hemisphere and if the right hemisphere went into an epileptic seizure maybe the, the left wouldn't go into it and it, it worked clinically it, it was very very helpful but what we found was we literally cut consciousness in half with a knife we find that the personalities are different the right hemisphere often has a different personality than the left and that the left, one person, for example, that uh, V.S. Ramachandran study, the left hemisphere believed in God, the right hemisphere was an atheist. That's right, I'm proposing that your consciousness is a fundamental reality in this vast social network of conscious agents. And uh, one thing that comes out in the math, is, in my theory, is that when two conscious agents interact, they create a new single conscious agent. And this, so you can have very, very simple agents that have very, very simple, like only two experiences, and maybe two actions that they can take. I call them one-bit agents. But when two of these one-bit agents interact, you get a two-bit agent that has maybe four possibilities. And, and 
by the time you get to me, I don't know how many, you know, billions or trillions or who knows how many. But then, think about my two hemispheres. There's evidence that when the corpus callosum is cut, they have separate consciousnesses with potentially separate contents and separate personalities and even separate religious beliefs. But when they're connected with the corpus callosum, there's what I call me. There seems to be a single unified person. And so that's another interesting thing that comes out of this, is trying to understand, this theory opens up the idea that, that, that you're real and that you're also two conscious agents, not just one conscious agent, you're two. And the theory says you're a whole infinite lattice, all the way down to these simple one-bit agents going all the way up to the two hemispheres and finally to the one agent that's you. And then the theory leaves open the possibility that, that just in interacting with other conscious agents, other agents are being formed.